This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers Podcast. With Tony Bruschi. We are joined right now by Deborah Ahearns, former public defender and professor of law at Seattle U School of Law. We're continuing our conversation about Brian Koberger and the recent accusations that the DNA on the knife sheath may have been planted by the police. This accusation, of course, coming from the defense. It seems like quite an extreme accusation to make right now, especially with all of the evidence that has been mounting up against him. Again, is this part of the process? Is this part of essentially trying to campaign for the potential jurors in Moscow? Do we have a sense of possible reasonable doubt? Or is there more to making a claim like that? Because I would think once this thing gets underway, if that claim is completely bogus, it does nothing but hurt the defense of Koberger. I think part of it is it may be trying to plant the seed of doubt in the potential jurors. But part of it is that over the past 20 years or so, a lot of things that you might see on CSI or forensic files that would be supposedly scientific inquiry into somebody's guilt, say footprint analysis or bite mark analysis, it's been debunked. A lot of it's been debunked as essentially being junk science. DNA is not junk science. It's not if you have two samples, there are sometimes some things you can do to argue about maybe alternative methodologies that the examiner should have used. But the actual underlying science behind DNA matching is really strong, robust, peer-reviewed. You can't do much with it. And so if you're going to make an argument about that very strong evidence, the argument generally does have to be around some form of transfer, contamination, planting evidence, something that suggests not that the DNA doesn't match, but that the DNA does match because the science will bear that out, but it matches because the DNA somehow got onto the tested item or person or physical evidence in a way other than the defendant put it there. So I think that they're forecasting that's the defense for the DNA evidence that they're going to have to present at trial and Maybe they're workshopping that publicly to see how people respond to it. But I think that's extremely strong evidence. And so they're going to have to come up with some explanation for it other than, hey, maybe the samples just don't really match. Yeah, and, and But the question would be, what is the argument? Why would the police be trying to frame Brian Koberger, of all people? He's not O.J. Simpson. He's not this figure that has fans and love and all that for him. He's just the average Joe or below average Joe that is accused of committing a crime like this. The logic doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And if you're going to make that sort of claim, is that going to have to be backed up in court at some point? Or could it just be that didn't stick and we're going to brush over that and never bring this up again? I think that you would ask questions of the DNA examiner or maybe, you know, other people who are witnesses at the trial to the yeah. effect of, okay, you can say that the samples match, but you can't say how the sample got on to the ninth sheet, right? So you would be able to elicit those kinds of answers. And so you would be able, I think, to make that argument. If I, again, I don't want to backseat drive somebody else who is working on this case, I think it's probably safer to suggest that maybe the evidence was accidentally transferred somehow mm -hmm. as opposed to purposely planted. But if you are making the purposely planted argument, again, it's a little opaque from the grand jury indictment in exactly what order the officers did everything. Sure. But certainly you could make an argument, look, they have a whole community in O oh, that is absolutely terrified because they have an unsolved quadruple murder. Parents are taking their kids out of school. Students are going home. Everyone's in an uproar, tremendous national attention. And so whether or not there's any motivation to frame one person in particular, if you already have some evidence that points in their direction, video evidence of their car being in the vicinity at various times, for example, then maybe you motivation to try to get a suspect identified and arrested as quickly as possible and to calm down this community and this national attention. And I think that would be the argument for why police would have planted the evidence, not because they were going after him in particular, but that they had him in mind as a suspect and that this would be a pretty, pretty compelling reason to arrest him. 
What do you make of the alibi, if you will? And I say alibi in air quotes, because (laughs) I don't know what that really was. Evidence corroborating Mr. Koberger being at a location other than the King Road address will be discussed or disclosed rather pursuant to discovery and evidentiary rules, as well as statutory requirements. According to Ann Taylor, it's anticipated that the evidence may be offered by way of cross-examination of witnesses produced by the state, as well as calling expert witnesses. The word may is what really stood out to there, stood out there to me. It's anticipated this evidence may be offered by way of cross-examination. If they have this alibi that they claim to have, why would it be, Why would they wait to come out with it cross-examination with expert witnesses? I would think if you have a true alibi, you say it now and you avoid a court case, you avoid all of this. If there isn't that clear of an alibi, that's really not an alibi. That's just an excuse. You're trying to argue something that really can't be verified. Every state pretty much allows defendants to sad, sandbag the prosecution, right? We used to joke about it that the biggest tool you have in your arsenal as a criminal defense attorney is the element of surprise. Mm-hmm. Prosecutors have to basically tell you what they plan to do, not everything, but disclose a lot of information to you, and you don't generally have reciprocal obligations. The two areas where you usually do are if you plan to claim insanity, you have to let the state know that so that they can engage in a psychological examination of your client. And the other one is alibi. If you're planning to say your client wasn't there, they were in another place, then you have to disclose that you plan to claim that that is a defense. Usually the reason similar to having to disclose that you plan to offer an insanity defense is so that the state can examine your witnesses. Where I practice, we had to provide, if you had alibi witnesses of your own who you were planning to present, You had to provide a list of the witnesses and contact information for them so that the state could independently interview them. It sounds like he doesn't have this. It sounds like to any extent he's planning to claim that he was somewhere else, he has an obligation to disclose that's a defense he plans to make, but that he doesn't have his own, it doesn't sound like, independent witnesses who he's planning to offer who the state would be able to examine or he would have had to disclose those. That's my read that he is hoping to establish an alibi through asking questions of witnesses who are already going to be presented by the state. And I'm not sure really what that would look like. This is an examination of the hidden human condition. This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. 